the upper school. Hi everyone, I'm Alex Lewis. I'm the behavior analyst at the lower school. Great, so we have the pleasure today of kind of going over with you guys toilet training. We call it toilet training 101, um, turning messes into successes. So um, let's get started. Okay, so first I want to just make a, a disclaimer that the suggestions here are just general suggestions from toilet training. Although Alex and I have pulled from many sources and those are at the end, but these are your bare bone minimums necessary for um, daytime training for urination. We can talk about BM trainings, we can talk about nighttime trainings, but for the most part, we're gonna just get you started with daytime urination training. But this does not necessarily mean we won't talk about that other stuff if there's time and you guys really wanna talk about it. So the suggestions can be modified to accommodate those implementing the, the, the program. This is not an end all be all. You guys can you know, take what you want and leave the rest. What we can do here, as a, for the behavior sur, uh, support department, is it at once you guys are ready to undertake this, if you want to do this at home, we will make ourselves as available to you guys as much as possible. Um, you got to be consistent and persistent for success, and this is a lot more difficult on the parents than it is for the child. Um, and again, I said we will support you through this. It's kind of nice because we have a, uh, a parent here who actually during the summer we worked with her and her son. Um, during toilet training. So Claudia, do you mind saying a few words and some words of encouragement to our Not family? Not at all. Not at all. That's why I'm here. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Claudia, my son, Justin. <laughs> hi. <Hey. laughs> um, we worked this uh, last summer, as Jimmy was saying, on toilet training with Justin. Uh, when I first decided to do it, I really thought that it was going to be a very daunting process and what was so great about working with Jimmy and Aisha and at the time it was uh, Marissa um, was that they really gave me the encouragement that I needed to hang in there and they gave me great tools that I could use to you know help be consistent with Justin and help to have consequences. I think one of the best things that that Jimmy particularly um, ever told me was that you know Toilet training is just like anything else, you know, we have to just kind of keep that consistency going in order to make sure that, you know, our son or our daughter just understands this is something that we have to learn like anything else. And a lot of people may tell you, well, you have to look for these signs to see if they're ready. And this whole idea of a child being ready to be potty trained. No, it's it's something that can be taught like, like any, you know, any skill, uh, toilet training can be taught. So, Forget all that, you know, is he ready, is she ready stuff. Um, but most of all, just, you know, give yourself a break because it's not necessarily an, an easy thing to learn. You may have some setbacks. It may take longer than you expected. It took longer than I expected. But in the end, because I stuck with it and I checked in a lot with the BCBA team at MSA, who was amazing, um, Justin was able to become fully day potty trained, I would say, within, within a month you know, or maybe a little bit longer, but he is doing great. He tells me when he needs to go to the bathroom. He really doesn't have any accidents. And now I'm starting to work on night training because I was so successful with the day training. So um, I'm here personally, if any parents want to commiserate or <laughs> vent or, you know, ask any questions on how it goes, but you guys can do it. You definitely can do it. Do you want to keep going, Claudia? I can, I, I just love hearing you talking about it. <laughs> I'm but telling really, you, the BCBAs, they're, they're like, you guys are amazing when it comes, especially to potty training. Like you guys were a lifesaver. So parents really lean on them, ask them your questions, your concerns. They, they really are a great resource. So take advantage of it, definitely. Well, thanks very much for that. It's a little something extra in your check this week. Thank you. All right, guys. So let, let me review the agenda with you so you can kind of get a general idea of where we're going to be going in, in this next hour. So we're gonna, we're gonna review um, some basic principles from our previous um, workshops. And as behavior analysts, we're gonna say that toileting is just another behavior. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you an overview of what those basic principles of human behavior are. And then I'm gonna re review it from the perspective of what does toileting mean? So what is the antecedents and the consequences for someone who is toilet trained? Um, we'll talk about some of the behavioral necessary prerequisite skills. We'll review some of the materials 
And then I'm gonna go through with you the general procedure for daytime urination training. Again, they're not etched in stone, but we, we wrote it in such a way that it's scripted out that you can actually follow it um, as a guide. We'll talk about some uh, special considerations and then we'll leave it open for uh, questions and answers. But at any moment, you know, as we go through the material, I'm, uh, we've inserted in a lot of opportunities to pause, to digest the material a little bit and give you guys an opportunity to ask as many questions as possible. And if it pertains to the topic, we'll address it. If it pertains to something that we'll be talking about a little bit later, we'll, um, we'll defer it to that, okay? So here we go. Alex, you wanna take this one? Sure. <laughs> um, so toilet training milestones. So toilet training is an independent functional skill that most um, children acquire around the age of four to five years old. Um, less than 50% of children uh, with special needs um, have acquired this skill by age four to five years old. So sometimes there is um, some more explicit training that does need to be done um, specifically with the type of students who attend MSA. Um, sometimes it's required for other places. So, you know, we, some students do have toilet training programs in school. It's also sometimes, um, it's also helped with the kind of practice these skills in home settings as well. Um, and toilet training does save money. I like that you threw that one in there, Jimmy. Um, <laughs> saves money on clothes, on diapers, on cleaning materials. And so- Furniture. Is just, yeah, so this is just sort of um, an overall um, like milestone slide um, discussing toilet training. And then do you wanna go to the next one? Sure. Or so did you wanna add anything? Um, yeah, you know, in, in you know, we're saying here most kids are trained by four or five. In other, other countries and more of the Eastern countries, sometimes toilet training is done by one and a half to two years of age. So it's really seems to be more of an environmental kind of thing. Um, just, just kind of a personal side note, this is Alex and I's first time doing it together. So if, uh, if, I, if we keep going back and forth because we haven't figured out our rhythm yet. So I threw kind of Alex over there. He got a little anxious when I asked him to do this slide. Anywho, okay. So in toilet training, you think about there are three general goals, right? So the first one, and there's, these are in no particular order, but when we're, 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 we're working on toilet training, we're trying to ask ourselves, which goal do we want to work on? For the most part, it's probably all of them. But the first one is requested toileting. In, in other words, the learner is able to ask to go. You're, you're at home, the learner says, I have to go to the bathroom. You're outside in the community, the learner says, I need to use the bathroom. The second one, which is what you guys want to have at home, is self-initiating toileting. That is, your learner just gets up when they have to go and goes. And then the third one, which is default, the ones that we kind of primarily use at schools, is scheduled toileting. I went to Catholic school many, many, many years ago, and we were all schedule trained. We went when the nuns told us it was time to go to the bathroom. And then this, this will be our kind of default. So we'll talk about in our process, we're gonna talk about scheduling toileting visits and how to build in two things. We'll talk about how to build in requesting and then self-initiation. But for the most part, I think one of the issues at the for, for our parents who are at the lower schools, the bathrooms are typically not located in the classroom. As a result of that, we have a tendency not to work on self-initiation in the sense that they just get up and walk out of the classroom. What we do work on is more requesting and schedule training. Okay. Any, whoop, any questions on that? No? Okay, cool. So basically, here's an overview for those of you who have already come to some of our previous workshops. So these are the basic principles of applied behavior analysis. So the way a behavior analyst will frame things as for, we'll, we'll look at things from a antecedent behavior consequence. So what does that stuff basically mean? It basically means that there are events that occur before we either say or do something. And then there are these consequences, not these kind of consequences that you, know, you typically think of, but events that happen after we say or do something. To elaborate a little bit further, when we, when we look at the things that we say or do, there are things that usually happen before. And there's two types of things that happen before we engage in a behavior. We usually have some type of motivation. When we talk about motivation, I could be deprived of something which makes, something, makes me want something more. I could get something a lot more that um, I like, which makes me want it le less likely. Or I can be in my own internal aversive situation, which would make it much more likely that I would do something to get out of it. 
And then once we have these motivations, there's these things in our environment, these people, places, or things that are typically correlated with particular aspects or consequences. So for example, if I haven't eaten food for a long period of time, it would make food a valuable reinforcer for me. And as a result of that, getting food would act as a reinforcer. But I don't respond, I don't do anything unless there are things in the environment that are signaling food is available. So here at my house, I might walk to the kitchen, I might go to the refrigerator, pull the, the refrigerator door and pull out the food. So at any given moment when there's motivation, there, have, there has to be things in the environment that signal the reinforcement is here, the reinforcement is not here, or there's no reinforcement whatsoever. And that's what we mean by when we talk about consequences. So that when we say or do things, three things have usually happened in our lifetime. One, we might engage in a behavior, and when we might get something we like, or something that we don't like gets removed. And as a result of that, we would have a tendency to do that much more often. We call that reinforcement, okay? So if I haven't eaten food for a long period of time, and now I go into the kitchen, I make myself a sandwich, well, what happened in that situation? I got something that I liked based upon my motivation. As a result of that, I would be much more likely to do that again under similar circumstances. And another one, I might have an itch. And when I have that itch, it's aversive to me. And what do I do as a result? I scratch it. And now what happens as a result of the scratching? Something that I don't like gets removed. And as a result of that, the behavior of scratching will get reinforced. So that's, I'm, I'm just trying to set up the, the conceptual analysis of what toilet training will look like, because it'll be a, a, a there'll be a way it looks like, but we're, we're really concerned about is the reasons why we do the things we do. And there are also two other kind of general consequences, which we call extinction and punishment. And basically ex extinction means that once we've engaged in the behavior that typically has been reinforced, there's no more reinforcement. And as a result of that, we, it has a tendency to kind of die off. Punishment, although it's, it, it's very controversial, the word in and of itself, in behavior analysis, it has a very different meaning. I don't know why they use the word punishment, but it's the word that we have. So I'm gonna explain it in a different way. So I want you guys to think of punishment as a consequence or something that happens after a behavior where two things could occur. You get something that you don't like or something you like gets removed. And as a result of that, you would be much more less likely to do that in the future. So if you think about what our lives are, right? From the moment that we're sitting here right now is that we're moving through time and space. And as we move through time and space, we are saying things and we are doing things. And the environment, the external things and the internal ones are giving us constant feedback. And that feedback could be getting things, getting things taken away, nothing happens. And as a result of that, we become all the, you know, we are a cluster of our behaviors. So that's kind of a, that's like the basic principles that we're going to be working off of. So now let me explain that, what that basically means as it relates to toilet training or what toileting is. So if you think about it from an antecedent perspective, what is the motivation for us going to the bathroom? Well, I know for me, it's usually some discomfort. I, I don't, my bladder gets full, uh, my, my, <clears throat> my bowel is kind of, you know, filling up. And, a result, and, and because of that, there's a feeling of discomfort, right? In addition to the feeling of discomfort, I also need a signal. I need a I need a person, place, or thing where I know if that if I engage in the urine in urination or having a, a bowel movement, that that discomfort will get removed, right? So when I'm sitting here and I'm drinking lots and lots and lots of coffee, I'm drinking lots of water, after a period of time, my bladder gets full, it, it creates a feeling of discomfort. And now what do I do? I get up and I go to the bathroom. I don't go and urinate on the couch. Why don't I urinate on the couch? Because my wife would probably kill me. So in a sense, I, there are certain people, places, or things where it's correlated with urinating or having a BM. And as a result of that, I will do that much more likely in, in the future. If you notice, it, I, you know, we have in here removing discomfort or feeling good or even praise. Most of us, when we go to the bathroom, we don't go to the bathroom because someone is outside the bathroom telling us, way to go, going to the bathroom. The reinforcement for, for going to the bathroom is usually some internal characteristic or some sense of, of the relief of discomfort. When we talk about our to uh, toilet training um, program, we will build in some external reinforcers in the beginning 
so that we can fade out of that, okay? Are there any questions on that? Nope, okay. Oops, sorry guys. All right, so here's some behavioral prerequisites. Depending on what you read, depending on what discipline, there will be a whole host of behavioral, or, let, me, let me rephrase that, of prerequisites before you, be, you can begin toilet training. From a behavioral perspective, these are the bare bones minimum prerequisites necessary. Anything else that your learner might have is a bonus. But here's, here's some of the prerequisites. If your learner can stay dry anywhere between one to two hours, that's a good prerequisite. If your learner can willingly walk to the bathroom, that's a good prerequisite. If they can follow very simple, and again, these are not end all be alls. Um, they can follow very simple instructions, pull your pants down, sit down, wait. Um, for some of you parents who are writing notes, um, we will send this PowerPoint after the presentation. So just want you guys to know that. Um, if your learner can sit for three to five minutes without too much, with, without any challenging behavior, they're not afraid of the bathroom. There's limited challenging behavior. Other, other cognitive skills will help, but they're really not necessary. Many years ago, and I can't remember the reference, you know, when I was going through all these different toilet training workshops, one guy said, if your learner can walk and sit, you can toilet train someone. And I've always held on to that. I've added the, the caveat of if your learner can walk and can sit and you have a powerful reinforcer, you can toilet train, okay? Any questions so Jimmy, or, or Alex, do you want to add? Yeah, well, I just wanted to also add to that. So if there are, um, if you're looking at these pre prerequisites and you're finding that your learner might not have all of the prerequisites necessary to start the toilet training process, don't fret, that's okay. Um, the reason we go over this and go over these prerequisites because it's helpful for us to know that if your child does not yet have these skills, it tells us that we need to target those skills first before we maybe begin the more the more formal toilet training procedure that we're gonna outline for um, the majority of the remainder of the presentation. So if your learner is having challenging behavior in the bathroom or is unable to sit for three to five minutes, that is, that is okay. That is not like they will never be toilet trained. That just tells us that we need to maybe take a little bit more um, smaller steps and break those behaviors into more manageable units for, um, for your child. Yeah, that's a great point, Alex. And we, we have some learners in our schools where we are working on some of these prerequisites. You know, we might just take random walks to the bathroom. You know, <clears throat> we have a strong, powerful reinforcer. We might say to the learner, hey, let's go to the bathroom. We walk to the door and we might just deliver the reinforcer and then let them come back. And what we do is we start to build in tolerance to go to the bathroom. So again, that was a really good point, Alex. I'm sorry I didn't address it, but um, if your learner is stuck anywhere, anywhere in some of these prerequisites, by all means, reach out to the behavior support department and we'll, um, we'll help set up some things with you. Materials, okay. So some of the things that will be necessary, we think are necessary, and what, the, what some of the research in the behavioral journals suggest are necessary are underwear. This is a big one. This is a huge, 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 huge um, um, need, okay? We, we say not to pull a learner in pull-ups because does anyone know what the difference is between a diaper and a pull-up? Anyone? There is no difference. The only difference is that this has a, a more elasticity. For some particular reason, we think by putting a learner in a pull-up now basically lets, you know, kind of gives them the indication that we're going to be doing something different. The reason why we put kids in underwear, there, there's a few reasons. One, it signals for the learner that the world is going to change a little bit. So when I put my mom and dad put me in underwear, it signals that urinating is not going to be the option anymore. It's a different material, which will also help us to detect accidents if needed. So what we suggest is no pull-ups, getting, getting your learners into underwear. And we'll talk about, you know, when you put them back in pull-ups at the end when we go through our procedure. The type of clothing that you'd want to use. You want to use easy to pull up and down types of pants, pants that do doesn't require um, too much adult help. Grays or, or tans are usually the best or um, gray underwear. Why? Because if we catch the learner having an accident, 
there are some things that we'd want to say and do in the process. If they're wearing white stuff, it's, it could be difficult to see the learner having the accents, which are all going to be part of the process, which are all part of the natural progression of toilet training. <clears throat> if you need pool shoes without socks, if necessary, strong, strong, strong reinforcer. Let me say that again. For any good successful toileting program, you have to identify one or two strong reinforcers that the learner gets if and only if they go to the bathroom. And this one is a very, this one I'm, I, I'm a real big stickler on this one because if, a, if a, a parent doesn't have this, we cannot be that successful with toilet training. Because remember, what's the idea behind here is that when the learner has that feeling of discomfort and they go to the toilet and they urinate or, or have a BM in the toilet, something good happens, right? One, the discomfort gets removed, but also we really want to select that out for our, for our learners by providing something that they get, they get if and only if. When I was toilet training my son many years ago, he loved Starburst. So the rule here at my house was if Uncle Billy comes over, if Grandma comes over, he does not, Nick does not get Starburst. When we're out in the community, there are no Starbursts. He only got Starburst if and only if he did the behaviors necessary for going to the bathroom. So as we go through these things, have that kind of consideration. If it's an iPad or um, what might be that one thing that you guys would be willing to deprive your learner to make the toilet training program successful. And again, I, I said I'm a big stickler on it, but even if you don't have it, we'll still work with you anyway. We'll figure it out. And then some type of data sheet. This is completely option, optional for you guys, but at school we take um, trial by trial data and we actually graph the results only because when you can see the progress or lack thereof, it helps us make these moment to moment decisions. I can't tell you how many times we've done toilet programs without any data collection. And at the first sign, the first accident, parents wanna give up. They're saying, that's up, he had an accident, it's the end of the world. But when you see it graphed and you see the successes over the accidents, it gives parents motivation. And it also gives the team a criteria of when to move or not. And I'll, I'll talk about, you know, when do we make any changes in the toileting program? Um, Alex, you guys, or Aisha or Anna, you have anything else to add to about materials? No, I think you pretty much covered most of it. Okay. So here are the essentials of the process. Okay, so these are the, the bare bones. The first thing we'll talk about is doing a baseline or dry checks for patterns. That is before, go, and I'll get into it a little bit, but overall it's one to two weeks before we start the actual process is just to do these, di these diaper checks. And what are we checking for? We're checking for times or places where the learner is most likely to stay dry or have an accident. Again, one of those prerequisites is, does your learner, can they stay dry anywhere between one to two hours? Why do we look for one to two, two hours? It shows signs of, of bladder maturity. And that's one of the biological things that we're going to use as a necessity. Removal of the diaper, underwear will be worn. We will um, start off with scheduled trips, having that powerful um, reinforcer, how to successfully deal with accidents. When we get into when accidents occur, we'll give you two different methodologies based on principles of behavior. And one will be either just ignore it and just kind of clean up your learner as you would without making, without any fanfare, without any attention. Or we might, we might suggest if it's, if you guys are, you know, if you guys are willing to do it, some type of punitive consequence. And that's, they might lose their favorite video for a half hour, or they might lose the opportunity to engage in a fun activity because now you have to do this cleaning process. So again, I want to keep, go I want to keep going back to what toileting is. It's, doing things in the bathroom for its consequences. When you go to the bathroom, good things happen. When you don't go to the bath, when you don't go in the bathroom, either nothing happens or you get something that you don't like or something you like gets removed for a brief period of time. And as a, as a result of that feedback, the learner will start to associate when and where they can go to the bathroom. Having a program evaluation of decisions. In other words, when do we make movements? When do we do changes in our toileting program? You know, at what point do we say, well, we're going to go from one hour interval to 90 minutes, from 90 minutes to two hours? When do we fade out the, the, 
the external reinforcers? Do we make any program changes? And we try to do that. We always, we try to do that with families based upon some concrete um, quantitative data. And then as much as possible to be consistent and persistent as possible. There are times where you might not have an, a lot of time during the day to do toilet training. What we suggest to do is put the learner back in, in, their, in their diaper because they're already used to going to the bathroom in their diaper. So if you're not using this process, put them back in the diaper. And that's why we recommend the underwear because once you put them in the underwear, you're basically signaling the world is going to be a little bit, excuse me, different now. Any questions on that? I really can't see everybody. So let me just pull it out. No questions. Is that a hand up? Yep, I see a hand up. Oh, I see two hands up. Oh, yes, yes. Um, Amanda, can you unmute? Sorry, whose hand is up? I'm like looking. Elizabeth, I see. I'm asking her to unmute. Yes, yes oh. my hand was up. Um, so I, I just wanted to uh, confirm. Um, so if, if, if the students that uh, get in train, is there like a time, like a, a rest time for the staff spotted training? Is that Sorry. what you were trying to say, going for the one to two weeks before potty training? I'm sorry, could you, can, can you repeat that again? Question? Yeah, I was asking if, um, when the public students start the toilet training, does it start up? Uh, there has to be a two weeks downtime down before the, the, the toilet training starts or something? I'm hearing like, is there downtime before the toilet training? I'm sorry, Elizabeth. Yes, yes. Because you were talking about like two weeks trying to do the diaper checks. Yeah. And I got it. Um, no, the, the reason why we say one to two weeks, that's part of the process. The part, so what we're just basically saying is before we implement the procedures, we want to make sure a few things. One, we want to establish some type of routinized idea of when our learners are typically going. <clears throat> and that's why we recommend the one to two, or not even one to two weeks, five days is, is good enough. What we're, the idea, Elizabeth, that we're looking for is are there particular patterns? Are there particular, given that your learner has a consistent diet, like we're not even going to recommend in increasing fluid intake. I'm giving you the bare bones minimum, okay? Based upon your learner's diet and their fluid intake, what we're looking for is are there times throughout the day your learner is much more likely to be dry or go in the pull-up? Because we can use that information to really front end the procedures. In other words, let's say, you know, when you're doing a, um, a, a diaper check, your learner wakes up and they're usually wet. And then from the, the morning that they're, you know, they wake up, it takes them about three hours before they first start the urination process. We might say, all right, you can start then your toilet training process or, you know, around that time. Okay, so the idea that this idea of the time is basically to get more information. Does that seem to answer the question? Yes. Yes. Great. Thank you very much. I see another hand. Yeah, Dante, if that's okay, really quickly, I just had a question. You said if you're not doing the process, you can go back into pull ups. Are you saying that once you begin this, you have to do underwear all the time, or is there kind of a mix? It can both exist while you're doing this process? Absolutely, <clears throat> yeah. So we're there. There are two types. There's ex, there's intensive toilet training. We're not talking about that. Intensive toilet training are those types of programs where we're actually in the in the bathroom for an extended period, like five to six hours a day. What we're doing here is your more looser based types of toilet training, and that's why the underwear is so important because the underwear is a new material. We don't put the learner in underwear and then put um, a pull up around it. It's completely underwear. And that is that it's really the first signal, the first step to let the learner know we're about to do things differently. If for some reason you cannot follow through with the procedures, what we say is default back to the pull up because that's what they're used to anyway. And there are some kids who will stay dry all day in the underwear. And once we put them back in the pull up, they start urinating again. There's procedures for that. Okay, so you can kind of do a little bit of a mix of both, but obviously introducing the underwear signals change. I understand that. Yeah, and what we would suggest is to, when you're, you're gonna partake in this, try to find a time where you can, you can 
allocate a lot of time, like during a breaks are, are a great time, but doing it a few hours here and there, it's just gonna make the process a lot longer. Okay. So the answer to the question is yes. Okay, good, thank you. Okay, I saw another hand. I just, um, I had a question about, um, we, we struggle with finding uh, powerful reinforcers for our daughter. She's a child who um, she's not overly attached to. She doesn't have a special toy or something. She really, she likes a lot of different things, but almost equally. And um, so I, the idea, everything else seems completely doable, but a really strong uh, reinforcer is the thing that in my head I'm thinking is going to be a, a, a struggle. Okay, so a few suggestions. One, what you could do is maybe just watch her one day and see, you know, put particular items out, see what she has a tendency to gravitate toward. Uh -huh. um, if you would be, you know, and again, this is based upon your willingness is sometimes this is where the extra goodies might come in is, you know, like bringing yeah. some extra external stuff and just kind of field testing it, giving her a few of those and seeing is there anyone that she has a, a tendency to gravitate toward. Mm -hmm. um, there's always a reinforcer. There always is. Yeah. There always is. And, you know, it, it's beyond the scope of this presentation. But if yeah. you'd like, we can also set up a time with you to explore some other options of how to figure out developing or uncovering some other reinforcers. Yeah. yeah. I think the big struggle for us is that we don't, she doesn't eat candy in the house or anything that treat like. I mean, she does, she'll have a cookie or things like that, but we don't actually have never had candy. So um, as far as like edibles, that's always been um, a struggle. And I don't know if it's something we should just sort of like decide to do for this in particular. Um, if, I was, or, if I was to give you any suggestion, not as a BCB, but as a parent, I think yeah. I would, <clears throat> I, would um, I would I would forego all those concerns. Toilet training yeah. is a huge thing. It's huge. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, you know, the longer we wait and the more we're uncomfortable with, you know, oh, I don't want to use this type of reinforcer. It, it's it as our learners get older, it's not pretty. So mm -hmm. what I would suggest is, you know, be willing to give up some of your preconceived reservations about using this stuff, because once mm -hmm. once you get past this, it's a beautiful thing. It really okay. is. Um, that's that's one parent talking to another. Mm -hmm. a, yeah, absolutely. A, I appreciate that. CBA perspective. Um, I would say something different. Okay. But that's okay too. Anybody else want to add to that? It's going once, twice, three times. Okay. So getting started, conducting um, dry check baselines. So what we say here is to collect one to two weeks of data collection. You don't really have to um, do one, one to two full weeks. What we're looking for is patterns before we get started. Is, is, there some, I, is there some pattern of when your learner is more likely to go? Um, and how do we do that? What we typically do, and, and any of this stuff that you guys are interested in, we can send you all the documents. So basically the day is broken up into half hour intervals. So let's say your learner gets up at 7.30. There's a sheet that has, you know, um, from the time they wake up into half hour increments. And all you have to do, the learner is still in a pull up, they're going about their business. And all you guys are doing is every half hour is just checking to see whether the diaper is full or not. If it's full, you're right wet and you go about your business, you change it. If it's dry, you could reinforce the learner and say, great job staying dry, start to build in that process. And the idea behind that is to look for these particular patterns. That's, that's all I got on um, the dry checks. It's really not rocket science. Alex, 